Welcome to Retcon, where we have 99 problems, but a retcon ain't one. I'm your host, Salvador Berrigan, and with us today we got Tim Blakiki and Rick Rivera. Hey guys, what's going on? Hey, what's up? Hi guys. Well, as usual, we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today, and we're just going to jump right into it. The Killing Joke has been, uh, they've been kicking around the idea of making that into an animated film. Uh, with Mark Hamill as the Joker again, who, let's be honest, is at this point the quintessential Joker. I can't think of anyone else doing as good a job as him. I completely agree. I mean, Mark Hamill, to anybody uh, that watched the Batman animated series in, in the late 80s, early 90s, knows that that is the voice of the Joker. He is the voice of the Joker, um, and just as much... As he's the Joker, uh, Kevin Conroy is the voice of Batman. Do we have Conroy confirmed? No, as far as I know, if we don't. Uh, Mark Hamill basically said that he would come back only if, and obviously that was a stipulation that didn't hold true, only if Kevin Conroy also came back. I know from myself that my afternoons as a teenager as a tween, it, it, if I turned on my television and I saw that awesome, awesome Batman the Animated Series opening where the blimps came over Gotham skyline and shined the light down on the, the bad guys that were tied up, it, it was just going to be a good afternoon. I, <laughs> I, it was such a great, great thing. I'm so excited for this. I think the DCU animated series that they have going um, just is one of their feathers in their caps they do such a good job i don't know if you guys ever caught the uh, dark knight returns animated movie i did yeah yes uh that i it, it is hands down my favorite movie representation of batman that i've ever seen they did such an amazing job with that. I have watched that movie, no joke, probably 30 to 40 times since I wow. bought it. Yes, I'm, I'm not exaggerating <laughs> either. No, that's I, great. I will put it on and just fall asleep to it. it. It is so amazing. I could not be more excited for this movie. Uh, I am shocked that they decided to do it. I think The Killing Joke is such a controversial story. And... I don't know. Did you guys ever hear the Fat Man on Batman podcast with Grant Morrison? No, I missed that oh, no. one. No. Uh, they basically, the, the ending, They Kevin Smith and Grant Morrison are talking, and they just throw this out there as just kind of, they're just talking about the killing joke. And the, if, I don't know if you guys can really picture the last few scenes of the killing joke, but Batman and Joker are standing there, and Joker starts to tell a joke to Batman. And he's telling them about this joke about two guys who escape from insane asylum. And they get to the top of the building and they're trying to figure out how to get from one building to the other. And the one says, I got it. I'll just shine a flashlight across and you walk across the beam. Mm. And then when you get to the other side, you shine the flashlight across and I'll walk across the beam. And the guy says, no, of course not, because I'm going to get halfway across and you're going to turn the flashlight off. <laughs> and they just start laughing and laughing and laughing, both of them actually. And the cops show up and it's the end of the comic book. Well, Grant Morrison said, Batman kills him. And Kevin Smith just jaw drops and says, what, what are you talking about? He kills him. And he's like, well, he reaches up and he breaks Joker's neck. And that's why the laughing stops. And Kevin Smith, you know, just could not believe that this was the interpretation. And it basically kind of set the comic world on fire for a minute because apparently nobody else had thought about this. Wow. So I'll be super interested in seeing how they actually finish this cartoon. That, uh, that sounds really dark. I mean, I know that it's a uh, – that the, the, the killing joke is a dark story to begin with. Although – Oh, very, when... very. Alan, Alan Moore, very dark. And I think for anybody that hasn't read it, um, Tim or Sal, did you want to just briefly talk about just a summary of why The Killing Joke is such an iconic Batman storyline? Timmy, story you'll line. do justice to this more than I will. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. oh absolutely. It, it basically is Joker. It's, it's a story more about Joker than it is Batman, obviously. 
And it is Joker trying to convince the world that one bad day can turn somebody evil. And he wants to prove this by attempting to destroy Commissioner Gordon, I suppose. And he does this by shooting Barbara Gordon, which eventually paralyzes her, turns her into the Oracle, etc., etc. It's a non-canon story, basically, but they took aspects of it and kind of moved it forward. Um, in the original script, they it actually got a lot more graphic than what actually made it onto paper. There was... <sighs> A scene where Batman ends up finding, well, I guess Commissioner Gordon ends up finding photos that the Joker took after he had abducted Barbara and done certain things to her. And he's basically trying to turn Commissioner Gordon. And I I absolutely love it because even at the bitter end, Commissioner Gordon does not change and tells Batman to do things the right way. Uh it it should be a fantastic animated movie. I'm I'm very excited about it. I think that's one of the great things about Commissioner Gordon, uh, if we just want to talk briefly about that. I, this this story, I almost feel like any incarnation of Joker is frustrated with Commissioner Gordon because it almost feels like he can always get one over on Batman no matter what. Even if he goes back to Arkham, he still has that sense of accomplishment that like, yeah, I got to you. But Commissioner Gordon's one of he's a very very uh he's a very emotionally conflicted obviously um in a lot of stories but uh, he's almost like that pillar or that rock that almost cannot be jolted um especially when influencing Batman. It, it, he's almost like the angel on Batman's shoulder that always directs him um if ever Batman kind of gets a little lost Commissioner Gordon is he can be that character to guide him back in the right and it's direction. It's an interesting point only because Commissioner Gordon is obviously the commissioner of the police department. He he was that rock or he is that rock in Gotham when everyone knows that the cops are corrupt in Gotham. They know that you cannot buy uh, Commissioner Gordon. And so hey, he's like the Serpico of this uh, of Gotham PD. Other than the fact that he allows the vigilante to run loose in Gotham. I mean <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> Besides that one guy. <laughs> oh, God. That always cracked me up. It was like, let's just forget that it's... I, I think when it was Adam West, you're like, all right, everyone's a little silly in this universe, so it makes sense. But when they get dark and gritty, you're like, wait, he's still a vigilante. Do, do you want to do something about that, sir? <laughs> well, is anybody following the current DC Batman title? Where Commissioner Gordon is Batman? I did not know that. No, uh, at the end of Endgame, basically, Batman and Joker uh, die, but they immediately bring Bruce Wayne back, essentially. Okay. But to replace Batman, they turn Commissioner Gordon into a state-sponsored Batman. It's it's very interesting. If you haven't seen it, I think there are about two, three issues in. It's, I am very, very, very digging it. And Bruce Wayne's already involved, and what they're doing with Bruce Wayne is absolutely... Scott Snyder is a genius, and Greg Capullo's artwork, I mean, having already done Spawn and Creech, he's, he's just knocking it out of the park. But they, they're playing this really interesting angle with Bruce Wayne not having to have the responsibility of being Batman anymore. He can just be Bruce Wayne. And it's it's a great dynamic. I definitely recommend checking it out if you haven't. That's a good awesome. That's an interesting yeah, I'll, take. I'll look that up. That sounds way more interesting than what I had read. Hmm. Now when you say state sponsored, like does he have like patches on the bat suit, like a Pepsi he, logo and a DuPont logo, or no? But he is ran by the Gotham PD. He ah. is, he is. What's the word I'm looking for? He he gets sent out. He's on the police calls. He yeah. is there. They have almost instead of a a bat wing, they almost have a 
Bat Zeppelin that they release him in. He's actually contained. Awesome. I, I say that he's actually contained almost in like an Iron Man outfit. There was a joke. It it almost looks like he's a rabbit. He has these antennas on top of his ears, uh, on top of his head. And it's just a suit that he's in and he can actually leave the suit and he has his own Batman uniform that he wears also outside of the Iron Man outfit. Um, it's a great take. I, I'm really enjoying it. And I especially like that they've put almost a timetable on it. They Bruce Wayne's obviously coming back. Uh, they've unfortunately... I, I know Greg Capullo had a massive problem with it. They, the Justice League comic is in advance of it, and they're doing the Dark Side War, and Bruce Wayne's already Batman again in that, and it's yeah. actually taking place after the story that they're telling. And Greg Capullo was very upset with the timetable. He wanted it to match up, and it's not matching up. So basically, we already know Bruce Wayne's coming back. And what he's doing in the Dark Side War is actually really interesting because he ends up sitting in Anti Monitor's God seat and actually finds out Joker's real name. I don't know if you guys have seen that. That's a super interesting thing. It's one of the first three questions he asks once he sits in that seat and becomes essentially a god, one of the new gods. I, I, uh, did, I did see that. Yeah, Batman. I saw the. Yeah, I... Batman. Batman is a god. I mean, of course he is, but oh, it's so it's such a cool scene. And now I'm really getting off on a tangent. We I might need to say, move along. It's like, I, I had other questions, like, is Batman Union? Does he have a time card he needs to <laughs> Gotham is definitely a Union oh, City. Yeah, <laughs> I can totally see that. Be like, I would take down that thug, but it's five minutes till quitting time. Yes. <laughs> While we're on the topic of DC, let's shift gears a little bit to uh, the TVs, TV shows, where we know that Matt Ryan is going to be playing uh, Constantine in another in an upcoming episode of Arrow. I thought that was pretty cool. I just read that this week online. Uh, I only watched actually a few ep- episodes of Constantine on NBC, and I thought it was pretty decent. For you know, they they put it in a Friday night spot, which is a li- it can be a little unfair. Uh, for a show that, you know, it, it has so much promise, but it still has to build an audience. Um, but I'm glad, even though NBC canceled it, uh, it's it's kind of, they, I guess, because Warner Brothers is technically a distribution company of the NBC show, uh, they are allowing Matt Ryan to actually play uh, his character, John Constantine, in one episode of Arrow, that I th- and I believe it is this coming season. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I, I, that whole Friday night slot is is just a death knell for anybody. It really is. It can be a death sentence. Uh, and even going back to when I was a kid with Quantum Leap, once they put that in the Friday night slot, I knew it was over. So uh, sadly, it still continues to this day where Friday, unless you are just a superstar show, you you are literally facing a death sentence. You know, just a random tangent here, but because of that single problem, I've never understood why the networks don't make that Friday night slot just like a kid's slot. Because, you know, kids are going to watch shows because, you know, their their parents are out doing stuff. So just pander to them. It's actually a, a B- really good idea, Sal. <laughs> well, ABC used to have that with TGI. Oh, yeah. How awesome was TGI? Oh, that's right. Yes. Good point, yeah. Tim. Yeah. Uh, if I'm, I could be wrong on this, but I believe one of the production companies of Constantine actually runs those CW shows and is involved in Arrow and Flash, and that's part of the reason they're going to be able to pull him in what i read and then man i wish i had done a little bit of research on this but if i'm not mistaken in the episode where constantine shows up on arrow they're actually going to basically use him as a stepping stone to introduce another character and it's that character whose name i can't remember and that character is going to actually become a reoccurring character on arrow and it's somebody out of that uh, Constantine. What what do they? What does DC call that? Their Hell Universe. Ah, yeah, their Hell Universe. DC Dark. DC. 
Ah, I feel so stupid for not knowing, but it's a character out of that, and that character is going to become not a weekly character on Arrow, but a character that has major impact. Who, who has That's the power cool. over Supergirl? Yeah. Or sorry, who? What network is putting that one out? Uh, Supergirl is being put CBS. CBS. Okay. Yeah. And that's actually going to be on CBS. I thought that was a really big leap for everybody. Well, I think a lot of networks are trying to get into the whole comic TV show game. And now we're, we're seeing another major entity following CW, following Fox, and now CBS is entering, and ABC, obviously. Uh, and so now we're see, seeing CBS putting uh, basically their anti- uh, on the table with Supergirl, I don't know what you guys think, but after seeing the first trailer, it, there's some promise there. But all in all, it it was so the, emotionally that eight minute trailer felt so all over the place. It did. It almost didn't even know what it wanted to be. It wanted to be appealing to. A female crowd and then it wanted to be appealing to a male crowd and then back to a female crowd then back to the sex in the city crowd then back to men then you know, then, then to everybody it just felt so all over the place uh i i'm still on the fence if i'm even gonna watch the first episode can can i admit something you're gonna watch it no i already have the 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 entire pilot leaked and ah yeah, I watched it. I and? I know I know CBS. Oh is my many. god, Timmy. Uh, uh the the pilot I'm going to keep this spoiler free, but I <laughs> you you basically already summed it up. It's it's not going to be Smallville, which is kind of what I hoped it was going to be. There is so much sex in the city in it. There's so much Gilmore Girls. There's so much, you know, Pretty Little Liars. They they really, really, really are trying to make this a show that girls, females, women, mothers, daughters, they they don't want this to be a male dominated show, and they are going to do this almost as much as Smallville played up the the angst of being a teenager and they're going to literally redirect this to the angst of being a teenage female. Okay. And then all of a sudden throw in these awesome. And, and I do have to say that the budget for this show looks pretty impressive because the special effects are actually a little bit nicer than arrow and, and uh, flash. Right. Um, and I noticed that with the trailer too. Yeah. Yeah, they've they've sank some money into it. So <laughs> far, everything that I've seen or heard of this thing makes it sound a lot like my super ex girlfriend. Do you guys remember that movie? Oh, oh no! Yeah, please let's not bring up. <laughs> it, Just... It's not it's not a bad comparison though. That it, it that's kind of what they're going. You know that for. that was supposed to try to draw in the superhero crowd uh, at the same time appeal to women while still trying to be a romantic comedy. And I yeah. mean, I personally think romantic comedies are probably one of the worst things out there. I mean, it's just saccharine and just so bad. It's not even a real depiction of what real romance is like. But that's another story for another day. That movie in of itself wasn't even very good, but it was only because I felt like it was trying to do too many things without really establishing a clear story. That's exactly what the show looks like. I mean, and again, there is nothing wrong with targeting a female demo. There's nothing wrong with making it um, very, very uh, uh, female-driven, very Sex in the City vibe. But you know what? S- stick to stick to that. It almost looks like it just it's going to be all over the place where it will target females uh, first and foremost. But then it's also going to want those audiences. Uh, the male audience is that it, that's curious about watching this show, but you know, sadly, it, that's it, you you can't have both. It, they can try, but I just don't think they're going to be able to have both. So they're either going to have to have one identity or nothing at all. It's when it comes to writing these female characters, I think we we really get stuck in a the legally blonde perspective when it comes to how women are written, and I want to see more more women who are more realistic dealing with some of the problems that, you know, being a woman, you know, especially one who's a superhero, runs into. 
And I think just having a you know cookie cutter girl who deals who happens to have these problems in the big city is not the way to go with this character, and they will ruin it faster if they go that route. Agreed. There is talk already of them tying the universes of Arrow, Flash, and Supergirl together. Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think it's reaching? Do you think because of the two... I already almost feel like Flash and Arrow have two totally different tones. I, I know they've already obviously already crossed over, but they unto themselves almost have two totally different tones. That's fine. I mean, why, which, why not? Which fit the characters. Do you think they can seamlessly work Supergirl into this? Having different characters with different genre types is perfect. I mean, we now have a gritty character versus a more lighthearted character. Have a different feel for another character come in. Have them have their personality, you know, portrayed on the show. I think it brings up a, a very good dynamic. It's not like we're all the old school whitewash uh, Justice League. We have different people with different stories and different takes. I think that brings a more unique perspective. So it can only it can only improve the brand. I agree. My biggest reservation would be that I feel Arrow has set a precedent on what exists out there. I feel like most of his villains, most of his compatriots, they've been very reality-based, very very down-to-earth. Flash is now, obviously, with what they did at the end of the first season with the Speed Force, he's starting to put it out there, and I, I think that's very cool. I think Jay Garrick showing up from Earth 2 in Season 2, I, I, they're doing some very cool things. I just don't know how you're going to take Supergirl, Krypton, all of this without bringing in Superman, because you can't, how you're going to bring that into the world of Arrow. How you're going to bring that into the world of the Speed Force. You're just going to have to tune in, buddy. That's yeah, all they're going to tell you. I mean, we don't not... know now. We can always speculate, but the, the execs are just going to tell you you're, you're going to have to just wait. And That's true. It's not my job yeah, to write well, it. At least not yet. Someday. Well, Someday, uh, Timmy. Unless it okay. gets canceled. Then you can write all the fan fiction you want. <laughs> That's true. Or or it could get retconned. Uh, <laughs> while we're on the uh while we're still uh talking about comics, let's shift gears a little bit to Marvel and that Civil War footage that came out. Man, uh we see Thunderbolt Ross saying the world owes you an unpayable debt. A great many people see you as a hero, but there are some who prefer the word vigilante. Saying that to Cap Wow. All right, I, I was never a big fan of Thunderbolt Ross, but yeah, he's the guy who, if there's anyone who's going to try to stare Cap down, I'm glad they chose him. But what about that footage we saw, you know, with, you know, uh, Black Widow, Hawkeye, you know, Black Panther, Ant-Man, all that stuff. It was just amazing. Are you guys as pumped about this as I am? Is, is, if I could squeal like a little girl, I would. I'll I'll let I'll let go. Tim, you want to go first? I am 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 I at the point already that I'm having a little bit of an art overload of Marvel? <laughs> I for for whatever reason, as much as Civil War when they first announced this. And my eyes lit up, and I could not believe they were doing the Civil War storyline, and I was so excited for it. Just the more and more I read about it, and the more and more I'm seeing that they're trying to cram into this, and it's basically becoming Avengers 2.5. And and we know where it's leading into the Infinity Gauntlet, and we don't know how this is the stepping stone to get there, but it's going to be a stepping stone in, in addition to guardians two and the, the few other movies that are going to lead up to it. There's just something about the promotion of this movie that is lacking for me. I... And I can't, I can't put my finger on it, 
and and don't get me wrong, this is not a DCU versus MCU sort of situations because I have loved everything Marvel has done up to this point. But there's just something about this that just feels a little off to me, and I can't figure it I, out. I think yet. this is it's the second act syndrome at this point. We're getting to the point where the entire universe has to feel like it's gonna fall apart. And what better way to have it all feel like it's all about to fall apart than to know we've got a looming threat coming in and the heroes who we're supposed to be cheering for can't even work with each other. Just have it all just fall apart on Earth and let's see, you know, where in Act 3 of this whole thing it all resolves itself. Uh, you know, it, the, to your point, I, Tim, I do agree with you on, on, on the point of you know, the Marvel overload, uh, we're getting so many movies now just pushed in our face and, and okay, now there's this one and now there's this one, but we're adding this guy and then now they, everything's going on. And yes, it, it, is, it is just this giant cluster F of superheroes uh, in, a uni- in this one universe right now. But I will say this it, that gives me hope for Captain America Civil War is that <clears throat> I felt the same way, almost the same way f- about – going into winter soldier i almost didn't know what to expect they they kind of they tease things here and there you know we knew the basic gist of it but we didn't know what it was completely going to happen or uh what was going to unravel and and i feel like civil war is going to be the same thing it's the russo brothers they did an amazing job with uh, uh with winter soldier they made it very political and very cerebral almost this bring things back down to like real issues of uh you know th- there's a conflict and what side are you going to take and there's a theme or a lesson to be learned and i think they're going to do the exact same thing with this yes there's going to be action in it but i think it's I, for the my general um i guess my guesstimate is that the, it's going to be a little bit more um a little more dialogue than we're used to seeing kind of like winter soldier I hope so. I hope you are absolutely right. Winter Soldier, I went and saw it with a friend. We walked out. My friend said that was not as good as I thought it was going to be. And I said that was twice as good as I thought it was going to be. I loved Winter Soldier, hands down. I, I'm not going to argue. I went in. I, I did the exact same thing with Avengers 2, though, thinking that it was going to be something. And I that movie I walked out of thinking, man, they really they they left something on the table there. Mm-hmm. And so I, I hope they can find a median and I wonder if it is a Joss Whedon versus Russo Brothers because I everything I've seen the Russo brothers do, even from episodes of community to the Winter Soldier, and they have already signed on to do both Infinity Gauntlets or Infinity Wars. I maybe they've got a better plan going than Josh Whedon did. Um, oh my God! Take that back. Take no, that back. No, I did. Really? I mean, you thought Avengers two was okay. the end all okay, be all. Okay, Whedon uh, I, is uh, likened to a god around here. Okay, I, I am still a brown coat at heart, and everything he does uh, is brown coats brown unite. Brown coats unite. Hey, there's nothing Whedon I, I don't like. So. You know, I, I, you know, part of me just will always protect Whedon just because I, I love his stuff. I, I kind of thought maybe I, I thought Avengers two showed that maybe he had had his fill of this universe, and I feel like maybe the Russo brothers still have a spark under them. You know, that's and 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 it, it is my hope for this movie. I don't want to see this movie honestly. When we made our little bet about. Batman versus Superman versus Avengers. My worry, honestly, when we started that bet was that somebody was going to say, all right, let's do Batman versus Superman versus Civil War because they're coming out very you know, similar times. They were, for a little while, supposed to come out on the exact same weekend. <laughs> right, I and eventually Ridiculous. DCU blinked and moved Batman versus Superman up, from, if I'm not mistaken. They moved it up, I think, a month or two. Had we made that bet, I might have blinked at that. <laughs> Honestly, I might have, but I'm, I'm still standing firm with my 
belief in what we made the bet on. I hope this movie does well. It just, I, I, there's something about it that's just not clicking for me yet. And honestly, part of it might be the fact that my, I'm not even the biggest Captain America fan. I'm truly not. I, I think his comic book representation lacks something for me. His movie representation, for me, is my favorite part of the MCU. I, I just think Chris Evans plays that character to the T from first Avenger to Winter Soldier and in both Avenger movies. I, I just, he's my favorite part. And if they end Civil War the way that the Civil War comic book story ends, I feel like there's going to be a little bit of joy taken out of me for Marvel movies moving forward. And so I'm a little nervous about that, too. I just don't see them pulling the trigger. There's too much money invested in Chris Evans and with kids and merchandising. I mean, that would crush their world. I just don't is his it. is his okay, contract okay. not basically I will, up, say, I will say this: oh, no. that we okay. gotta go with the BBC's way of doing stories. I love the way the BBC writes a story and they film it to however length they need. It's we are looking to just tell a good story. You know, it's not about you know, contracts, it's not about, you know, will people like this? No, it's about writing a story that is definitive, that is good, more importantly, memorable. It, it, it's one of those things that Marvel ha- kept doing for the longest time, where they wrote characters that were doing awesome things, and they weren't afraid to, you know, yes, everyone comes back, because that's that's Marvel, but I can see them killing Cap in Civil War. Did I just spoil that for anybody? It's, I was like, that's, that's not a spoiler if it's been out for that long. Come on, people. <laughs> Pick up a comic book. What are you doing here? Did you stumble right. on this podcast? Anyways, if they if they kill him, you know he's going to come back. It, in some other mm-hmm. film, in some other way, they've got the Infinity Gauntlets going around. Be like, hey, someone says, I wish for Captain America to come back. Be like, ding. I'm just saying. If they kill him now, <laughs> it would be a good way to move that story on and a rallying cry for a whole lot of other stories. And that would just send shockwaves oh. through the rest of the movies as they come out. It's not a it's not a comic book though. That's part of the thing that that worries me is that if Chris Evans decides he is done with this character, he's done with this character. And they of course can recast the character. But if you kill Chris Evans and bring back somebody else in that role, then you're not bringing back Captain America. I'll call my shot right now. They're either not going to kill him off, or if they do kill him off, it'll be in the same movie. Kill him off and bring him back in the same movie. Here's hoping for a good death, just so that we can see it on screen and hopefully have better stories in other films. I'd like to see that. While we're on the yeah. topic of that Marvel Universe, though, who's seen the uh, Doctor Strange, the new picks, with Benedict Cumberbatch? Woo. I didn't personally see them, but I read about it, and uh, the, from what I tell, uh, from what I've read, uh, the exposure that it got at D twenty three in Anaheim this past weekend uh, was a very, very positive reception, uh, especially for fans. It, um, from what I read, is very true to his character, and you know, Benedict Cumberbatch is. He's he's just this huge, huge up and coming actor, and um, I, I think American audiences are just getting used to him right now, and and this is probably going to propel him into like uber superstardom. If anybody knows or watched the show Sherlock, uh, he is just probably one of the most amazing actors, top five uh, in actors right now active. Um, so it, it great things happening. Um, it, it looks great from what I told, so can't wait to see when he's actually in a costume, I guess we'll call it, uh, and they reveal the first picks. But that's probably at least three to six months away from like right I now. Like I said, the BBC does good storylines, and that's where Sherlock came from. He showed his chops there, and he's perfect for that role. I'm excited for Doctor Strange with him in that role, only because we know he'll bring that sense of aloofness to the character. Or that prestige that you know Doctor Strange has. He's he's a uh, surgeon, a, an amazing surgeon who just happens to get or uh, lose the ability to use his hands. Who then per- who goes into magic? It's it's an awesome story, good story of redemption, finding yourself, and blah 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 blah. It's awesome. 
But hey, you mentioned D23. <laughs> Rick? Yeah. That, Tim? Oh, I th okay, go ahead. Uh, Rick, you're a, D23. You are a massive Star Wars was... fan. I mean, I know no one else bigger than you. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, I mean, so D23 happened this past weekend in Anaheim. There were a lot of cool, amazing oh, stuff that sorry, went on. Sorry, before you, before uh, you go any further. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. For those yeah, who don't know, ahead. what is D23? Oh, D23 is basically just like a Disney con. It's, it, Disney now has its own convention where they show off their wares. They don't need a Comic Con anymore. They don't need an E3. This is, D, this is Disney's E3. So basically, you know, now that they're aligned with Marvel, they released um, the footage of Civil War. They released the artist conception of Benedict Cumberbatch's Doctor Strange. And the most important thing that came out of D23 this past weekend was... Incredibles uh, 2. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, no, no. Did they do something else? They did, though. You know what? They are, they released the information. They are making it official uh, no more rumors. It is confirmed. Star Wars Land is coming to both the Anaheim property and to the Florida property. So Disney World and Disneyland will see Star Wars Land um, probably within, oh, I mean, what do we, you know, there's no guess or when it's actually going to drop, but just the fact that the wheels are in motion, there's concept art. It looks awesome. Uh, as a, a, again, as Sal said, I am the biggest Star Wars fan that I know. I have Star Wars tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, it, it, I've read most of all of the, the Bantam books. Um, I know they're all retconned now, but that doesn't matter because <laughs> I still love them. <laughs> so uh, the, one of the most interesting things that I read about this weekend about D23 and in, uh, in a video interview with J.J. Abrams, they asked him about what, the, what he thought about Star Wars Land, and he made a really good point is that uh, he would love to see a ride or an experience uh, – having to do with the Millennium Falcon. Millennium Falcon, as he said, um, more than any other character, almost at the same level of any character, it is a character and a life unto itself. So fans are super, super familiar with the Millennium Falcon, and it'd be a great way to showcase probably the, the most recognizable vehicle in Star Wars lore. Um, it, it, and uh, it's it would just be... I mean, I, the possibilities are endless with what you could do with the Millennium Falcon ride. And I can't wait. I'm sure I'll be well into my 40s by the time we get Star Wars Land. But, hey, I've lasted this long. I can wait five to, say, uh, five to eight more years for it. So uh, that's one of the cool things uh, that happened at D23. The other thing I do bring up is that um, for Episode 7 coming out on December 18th, uh, for many of us, we'll be going to see it on midnight, uh, December 17th. But... All of the official merchandise, the toys, the lightsabers, uh, the, the books, the books that are based upon the script of the movie, that all drops on September 4th. So that is literally less than a month away. And I know a lot of fanboys can't wait to get their hands on it, and neither can I, of the book that's based on the movie. I did it with all the prequels, and I'm going to do it with this one. I am a fan. When I'm a fan into something as huge as this, I want to go into the movie knowing everything. I want to know everything right away. And when that book drops, or I don't know why I haven't pre-ordered it on Amazon already, but uh, w when that book drops, I'm getting it, and I'm going to read it as fast as I can. So... That's my report from D23. If anybody has any questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> <laughs> so for those the, of you unfamiliar biggest... with the Millennium Falcon, it's the, it made the Kessel Run in less than seven parsecs? Or less than 12 it's parsecs? 12. It's 12, and, uh, which is a, a measure of distance, not time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, 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 the, the only difference I've been able to tell from the trailer that I saw, that it now has a square satellite dish on top of it as opposed to a round satellite dish has anybody else noticed that something to that extent yeah i thought that was an interesting the millennium falcon is one of those like souped up cars that's had parts you know replaced and uh put different things at different times and it's never been like just this one vehicle that that was made at one time it's it's you know it's been through a lot so it has i like that it's yeah. kind of cool to see. i think lando even called it yeah, a yeah jump, right? yeah I know I saw yeah, ship uh, this was maybe even going back two months ago. I thought this was interesting that somebody let this loose, but they're 
Star Wars is pairing with Pepsi, apparently, for their part of their promotion. And in Brazil, there was a Pepsi can that was released over a month or two ago Mm -hmm. that had C-3PO and R2-D2 on it. And C-3PO apparently has a red arm. That's correct. Uh, And you'll notice on the toys, um, anything promotional related right now, if you even Google it, it, you you can find it. Yes, he does have a red arm right now. We don't know if that's at the beginning of the film, at the end of the film. Exactly. But uh, he he definitely does have a red arm. I was shocked. That's how that information got out. (laughs) Well, and that's the thing, because as we, good point, as we get closer to the launch of this merchandise, a lot of these vendors, these merchandisers, they have their hands on the at least even just the visuals of them, if not the product themselves. So they're taking pictures, they're posting, they're excited about it. And yeah, they're not supposed to be, but hell, you know, we're in a very social media driven age to where you post it and, and it's it spreads like wildfire. And I think it's pretty cool and excited. <laughs> I I can't remember what movie it was, but I remember something being spoiled by the release of a Lego playset. Oh, that sounds so familiar. And and I just I was I wasn't even upset that it got spoiled, but I was shocked that a scene in a movie got spoiled by the release of a Lego playset. And it's just something that I feel, especially going forward, that any movie studio that really plans on making a massive impact with a certain scene needs to be aware of that. That they are, it's just such a rampant thing on the internet now that, you know, you you put something out there like that, especially at one of these expos that, you know, millions and millions of people are going to via the internet, I mean. And you got to be careful. Even I know you're trying to make your money. I know these movies are basically commercials for toys and for merchandise. But at a certain point, there's a, a cost-benefit risk analysis that you got to take. And if, if you're going to make a scene like an Empire Strikes Back where Darth says, you know, Luke, I'm your father. You, hey, spoiler no, warning. I apologize. You got to be careful with that. You know? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, it, to that point as well, J.J. Abrams and everybody in the Star Wars production has been doing a phenomenal job of keeping everything, major plot points, um, spoiler-free for the most part. And, uh, man, if they can ride this into this into December without a lot of spoilers, well, sans the people that read the book. Um, but uh, it, it's it's exciting because I'm sure there's going to be something major that happens that everybody's going to – it's going to be jaw-dropping. Let's hope you're right, man, because I know uh, everyone was disappointed with episode one. As long as we don't have a repeat of that, we'll all be okay. (laughs) Now, without bashing into Star Wars, I mean, I'm not going to lie here, Rick. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so I'm on the other end of Star Wars. It's okay. So, I know you're a big fan. You know what? I'm going to let you (laughs) have this. Thank you. I'll take it. I'll take it. I I wish Uh, I could say something like bad back to you but uh even uh, you know we now have that connection you and i admit it we've got the jj abrams connection so he he's he's yeah bringing the star trek and the star wars nerds together it's like hands across the universe (laughs) (laughs) sal what was your opinion though on the new star treks then oh i thought they were amazing I like the way that they retconned the movies so that it still still allowed the other universe that we grew up with, with uh, with the old Captain Kirk, to still exist while still having this one go on. That was a moment of clarity and brilliance, and whoever wrote that up should have gotten an Oscar for writing. Just hands down, you appease the old Star Trek fans, and you appease the new Star Trek fans. And I've always said this, that when they update... Uh, these sort of things it's not for the old fans it's for the new fans you're trying to get new people to come into it and you know what we got another star trek movie out of it and it was i thought it was a really good one so i'm all for it if it means that i can see what i love coming out more and more of and yeah you know nothing's ever going to be as good as the stuff that i grew up on but let's face it even the ninja turtles haven't aged that well when we go back and look Mm -hmm. at them 
that's not to give Michael Bay a free uh, pass. I still think he ruined that that whole thing. But I'll, I'll talk about him some other day. And Rick, what was your opinion on the Star Treks? Oh, as, as not being a Star Trek kind of guy, did they you pull know, you I, in? Yeah, it, it absolutely pulled me in. It made me. Uh, I mean, I had and I have general knowledge of the Star Trek universe, but it made me appreciate it even more. It made me love it even more. To Sal's point, I love the fact, or just yeah, whoever wrote that basic retconning or just kind of oh existing in multiple universe type they it, it was just that was absolutely brilliant um and that was probably to, out of those two movies that is my favorite element of it um and also the benedict cumberbatch's con i thought that was awesome too i mean shoot it it was it was a nice surprise it was you know buzzing around the internet forever but it was still cool um, and, and yeah, it, it's, it renewed my faith and I think it renewed faith in a lot of people's, uh, opinion about Star Trek. See, yeah, it, it, it only did good things absolutely. for the series. See, I, I have to 100% disagree. Ooh. I, I might be the biggest Trekkie that I know. There's not many of us left. I feel like I did not, I enjoyed the movies for what they were. I missed my old Star Trek movies. I don't think he stayed true to the core of what Trek is supposed to be. I think he tried to turn Star Trek into Star Wars, what, which is why. Okay, of course okay, he okay. Did. Let's, I mean, let's, let's 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 take a step back here. Really, you miss the quest for peace. <laughs> I, I miss all of them. I miss all eleven movies. I was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I I even shuddered a little bit when you said but... Trekkie. Because Trekkie is what the outsiders call us. We call ourselves Trekkers. We can get into a huge debate can, about that someday. But, but you see the dilemma, though. I mean, they had to make something that appealed to the mass audiences and making some, a quality product. I just don't feel like the last three or four Star Trek movies were quality products. No, I definitely agree that the last two Next Generation movies were absolutely terrible. Right. It just, I don't, I did not enjoy... Exactly what you guys were just promoting, I did not enjoy. I thought that if he wanted to reboot Star Trek, he should have rebooted Star Trek. I I hated, hated, hated the fact that they tried to play this alternate timeline. I I. But see, that was the that was the beauty of it was the fact you still have your old mm-hmm. Trek. But There's I no I would have had get, my. You're not going to get the old cast. No, I mean, no, of, of course, cast, but let's, we let's did get our own cast with with Leonard Nimoy playing prime Spock. I, I just, I didn't enjoy at all how they tried to tie them together and basically say like your thing still exists, but this thing's new, but they've interacted. I, I just wish they had completely rebooted it and allowed the actors, you know, to play the characters the way if they wanted to play homage to the old characters, that's fine. But he he tried to be too cute with it, and that's why the 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 second one, the Into Darkness, the whole con storyline, I I was so disappointed by that because he tried to play note for note that movie, and then the little twist at the end by flip flopping right. Spock and Kirk right. It, it it was this, like, I felt like a lame attempt at building Kirk's character because he, he's the captain at the beginning of the movie, but they yank it away from him, and the only way he can get it back is to sacrifice himself. So he sacrifices himself, but then all within 15 minutes, he comes back to life because of Khan's super blood. It, it just felt so convoluted. I felt like they had two-thirds of a plot, and then they're like, all right, we're just going to completely ape this movie that's already been written it wasn't original they tried to cram all these you know like they they forgot that they had yuhara and you know john cho's character it it they tried to force feed them back into it i i it just really disappointed me the new star trek that's about to come out that's being written by simon Pegg, i have such high hopes for Idris Elba's already been signed on to play basically the lead villain. It's going to be Klingon based. 
I really like J.J. Abrams, and it's sad to say that I'm more excited about this movie now that he's gone from that universe wow. than I was <laughs> wow. knowing that he was going uh, into it. Now, having said that, having said that, having said that, what I and, and I am a Star Wars fan, not as much as I am a Trek fan, but I am a Star Wars fan. I feel like the fact that he's not trying to reinvent anything, that he is literally building on something that's already put there. And obviously, since George Lucas can't tell time and has decided to go forwards, backwards, and now forwards again, you know, with his movie storytelling, I know he has nothing to do more than a consultant job with these new ones. But the fact that this is building off basically Return of the Jedi, and I I read somewhere that the 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 tagline on this movie should basically be who is Luke Skywalker and you know Luke's gone into hiding he's basically become Obi-Wan he is the last Jedi master the fact that he's building on something that's already put there instead of trying to reinvent something I have a little more faith in this movie than I did going into the second trek after I saw the first one. I could go on and on. Wait, George, George. <laughs> but, I was going to yeah. say, wait, wait, George Lucas was no, a no, consultant. No, 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 I, you know, I, I, I think... I hope they just gave him a Rubik's I, Cube and told him to sit I in the corner. I don't think he was an official consultant. I believe the story goes is that he offered his consulting advice and Disney basically just patted him on the head and said, that's cute, no thanks. Oh, you may actually... <laughs> Yeah, you you actually may be completely correct about that. I mean, that's okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it and Hilarious apparently that's how the story I... goes. But uh, yeah. I mean, oh, you know, we we can. I could go on and on and on and on and on forever about Star Wars. But I I think J.J. Abrams was in an interesting position or situation. He grew up a Star Wars fan. He really wasn't a Star Trek fan. Um, that I, I think that's why he took so many liberties with Star Trek. It's not the fact that he didn't care about the fans, but he wanted he just wanted to make a product that was relevant again and kind of bring it back. See, to, and and I and, and you're resuscitate. Absolutely right, and I feel like that shines through during sure. those two movies. Sure, sure, sure. I I will not all, argue with all that. I can, on that, all I can, that at yeah. all. All I can say about the whole thing is that I hope that. The i store, oh, the i store opens up on a friggin' Millennium Falcon. See how you guys like it when everything has friggin' flare. Lens everywhere. flares, lens flares, more lens, lens flare. flares. <laughs> hey, you know what? We need if more lens flares. He gives flare. me a solid quality movie that that just blows everything out of the water. He can do as many friggin' lens flares as he wants. <laughs> well, and another thing that I find very <laughs> yeah. interesting is he's not invested in this universe i believe right. rick you actually uh, yeah, i i had read this before but you brought this back to my attention that they originally are shopping this movie around kathleen kennedy at disney and they say do you want this okay no do you want this no jj Abrams, do you want this and he basically said he's such a fan no like this is too big for me not in the sense of like too big of a project but Right. I, I don't want to do this. I just want to sit back and watch what somebody else does with it. And he reconsidered and said, no, screw that. Nobody else can do a better job than I can do with it. But he's not doing episode two or uh, episode. Eight, eight yeah, nine. yeah, my bad. Correct. Um, he's not doing the second one in the series. Um, and I think that's promising also. Because Absolutely. I don't – he's not going to hold back. He's not going to say – this is an amazing idea. I sh- ooh, should I save this for the second one? No, 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 no. You, you know, like he's he sank himself into this thing. Yeah, exactly. And it's exactly like you said. I believe he denied him twice before yeah. coming around and basically said exactly what you said. He is such a fan that he knows he didn't want to let the fans down. He didn't want to give them a less than superior product. And he was afraid that he wasn't going to come through. But at the end of the day, he knows that he is the only one that can do that. 
So uh, I again, I'm I'm super excited, and I can't wait for this film to come out. Again, I'm going to say I'm going to repeat what I said uh, last week or a few weeks ago. I definitely think this this has a legitimate chance to be the biggest money making film at the box office beating Avatar. I believe it has a legitimate chance. When you said that last week, I it was the first time I had heard anybody say that, and I I thought you had lost your freaking mind i really did i i just pictured titanic i saw titanic roll through the movie theaters for what seemed like four or five months i I saw avatar do it with the 3d gimmick for the first real 3d movie and i don't know who was listening to last week's podcast but i have heard three or four other podcasts mention that in the past week and if you're saying it and these other people are saying it I, you may be right you may be right really you didn't just think goddamn fanboys it 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 maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what you know what if if it comes down to avengers versus bvs versus star wars i'm not taking that bet as much as i love the avengers i really think that the amount of momentum that this movie has is going to give it a massive push. Just massive. Absolutely. And so. it, I, this is such a weird thing, and I'm just recalling this off of my own memory, so I could be wrong. But if I'm not mistaken, Titanic came out in December, Avatar came out in December, and now Star Wars is coming out in December. Very and we, good point. We all know that basically late January, February is what what do they call it? Dump month. It, it basically when all these studios release these movies that they don't think is going to do very well. There this is not a summer blockbuster competing against other blockbusters. This is a movie being released at a time of year when people have money to spend, they're with their friends and family. And then even after the holidays, when it's still in the theaters, it's cold. There's not much to do other than go to the theater and spend your money again and again and again. Yeah. And this, this just as a completely random point, I actually did see something recently that talked about worrying about Deadpool being released in February. Wow. Which I had never thought of until I read that, which... It's weird that Fox is releasing that in February as opposed to in the middle of the summer. Complete tangent. Really, the only, I apologize. The only time you should worry about that is if they keep pushing the date out. I think Pluto Nash, oh. that movie, was pushed out like years. If they did that with Star Wars, then I'd be worried. Can I tell you a quick story about what? Pluto Nash? I was walking around a mall one day and somebody pulled me in and said, Hey, do you have 15 minutes to do a, a group survey? I said, Yeah. So they pulled me in, they th- they showed me three trailers of movies that were coming out. I don't remember the first two. The third one was Pluto Nash. And so I watched this movie, or this trailer, and I go, what on earth is this? And so they start asking me you know, questions about this, and they go, what do you think about this movie? And just completely flat-faced, I said, end of Eddie Murphy's career. And I was uh, right. Uh. It, was, it was not the answer <laughs> she was looking for, but I was right. Uh, Timmy predicting the future. Speaking of which, Rick, Hello. we've got a new segment with Rick's moment of. Clarity. I mean, I know we're running a little bit long, so I we just there's just enough time for a quick recap of what's currently on my mind. And I was gonna go through a few things, but I, I'm really, really centering on um, honestly today. I want to talk about youth and politics. We are at an age right now where a younger generation, our generation, are getting more and more involved into politics than they ever have before. And I think it is, uh, it, it is a great thing for our country. And I, can al- I also think it's very damning because we see a lot of things on the surface. But uh, you really have to do your due diligence if you are going to be a voter, if you are going to give a damn about the election uh, there is a P.S. There is an election coming up. We are going to elect a new president. And FYI, for anybody who's not 
in the political arena or surrounding themselves in politics are not really aware at all of any politics, that it is a travesty that a, a basically a businessman slash reality star is the front runner to be the next president of the United States. But I, I think that says so many things about the candidates that are there right now. Um, it's it just reeks that there is no obviously there is no clear cut front runner in the next presidential election, and I think that's a big problem. Um, it, the sad thing is, is that because Donald Trump is so focused on what he believes in, and he's the one that actually has the balls to say some very stupid shit and keep to that stupid shit. People are actually giving him credit for sticking to his guns, where um, as a lot of even Democrats, Hillary was the clear front runner um, coming into this election. And even last election, Barack Obama almost came out of nowhere. Uh, and, and, but Hillary has a knack of just kind of being a little bit wishy-washy. She'll flip-flop. She'll, she just won't be very, very confident uh, about her issues and where she stands on anything. And I think that's going to be, again, this, this is proving to be damning to her campaign. Um, and out of nowhere in the Democratic side, there's also Bernie Sanders, who's a very, very, a very liberal um, forward thinker. He could be the Democratic nominee. Uh, and I won't even go into the the Republican circus that's out there that includes Jeb Bush and uh, uh, we've got Marco Rubio and uh, God, uh, I, I can't even think of the, the uh, Mike Huckabee, Rand Paul. Um, you know, just give me, give me, a, honestly, I'm a liberal, I'm a Democrat. Just give me somebody good. I don't care who it is. Just give me somebody good. Not Donald Trump. Somebody, I just, if you know, if you're listening and you want to get more involved into politics, look it up. Watch Rachel Maddow. Watch Anderson Cooper. I don't care if you watch Rush Limbaugh or listen to him. Just be informed. That's all. Do your homework. Do your due diligence. Um, research the policies that you're voting on. Research the candidates that you're voting on. And uh, you know, good luck to the United States. I, again, I love this country so much. Um, I think there's so many people that shit on this country, uh, and that's your God-given right. As an American citizen, you, you absolutely have the right to do that, but uh, I, I think we've got a lot of promise um, moving forward, and it's really up to us. It's really up to this generation, and with, with all the resources that we have, the internet, social media, just read. Read up on it, um, and uh, look don't necessarily look at things that are just on the surface. Um, there's a lot more to than just the random thing that just came out or the email that got leaked. Read up on it instead of just uh, formulating an opinion based on your friend's Facebook post. That's all I got. Here, here, here. Just a, just a quick, quick retcon there. Bernie Sanders is independent. I'm sorry? That's his, and, uh, Bernie Sanders is running as an okay, independent. Okay, cool. Uh, and then remember, ladies and gentlemen, vote or die. Uh, we're going to go into our pick of the week. Uh, I'll kick things off. Uh, I actually was really impressed with the D&D Humble Bundle that just came out. I uh, put in to get the uh, Max Award for it so that I could get all the D&D comics. I mean, I personally love D&D. I play D&D once a week with my buddies. Uh, so the fact that I got a chance to read some comics that were put out by IDW was was fun. It was it was different than the capes that I normally read every single week. So to read, you know, a little bit of magic and whatnot was a lot of fun. So anyone out there, you still got a little bit of time? Go pick up the D and D Humble Bundle. Rick, my pick of the week. Uh, just go YouTube John Oliver's take on televangelists. It is absolutely hilarious and informative. It's all over YouTube. Um, there's nothing wrong with religion, even your pro-religion, your anti-religion, but these televangelists that are out there are absolute crooks. And uh, it, it is just a, a phenomenal video put together of just how ridiculous uh, and, and easy it is to make your own church and make ridiculous amounts of money off of just, just very, very um, uh, sad and vulnerable people. 
Timmy. My pick of the week is SummerSlam, WWE. It will be four hours on Sunday. I know that seems like a long amount of time. I even have issues with it. This is a shout-out also to our friend Raj, who cannot be with us this week. I know this would probably be his pick of the week. Uh, I feel like it's going to be a decent card, though. Stephen Amell is fighting with Stardust, or against Stardust, should I say, with Neville and King Barrett involved. There is the match that is too big for WrestleMania between Brock Lesnar and Undertaker, and title for title... Seth Rollins versus John Cena. I'm looking forward to this. I feel I feel like it's going to be a good one, and I look forward to our text roundtable that we hold every month for it. Yep. It'll be fun on the bun. Well, everyone, that's it for this week of Retcon, and I want everyone just to remember that it's all true until we get ret- retconned. Good night, everybody. Good night. night, guys. Bye-bye.